Hello guys and welcome back to my channel. My name is Tommy. I'm a human nutrition student and researcher at the university. What I do in this type of videos is to synthesize the lessons I have at the university and then explain and teach you the best and most valuable information you need to know. Today we're going to start a new series of videos in which we're going to talk about clinical nutrition. So the nutrition that we must follow in a clinic. So let's begin. Malnutrition first. Malnutrition is related with diseases because when people get in hospitals, they often get a poor nutritional value from their diet. Therefore, they develop malnutrition and this may complicate their instance at the hospital. Definition of malnutrition is the nutrient deficiency, which can be chronic or acute. The causes are either lower intake or lower absorption of those nutrients because maybe of a pathology, higher losses, for example, in a diarrhea, or higher requirements, both physiological and pathological. Physiological is when, for example, we are growing. A teenager needs more calories than an adult. And higher requirements due to a pathology is, for example, when there is a cancer. The cancer will need nutrients for it to grow and therefore it will steal the ones we are going to use for our own cell. Therefore the requirements are higher. Types of malnutrition. We have the caloric, which causes the marasm, take, which causes the quashokor, and the mixed, which causes the cachexia. Mixed is caloric and proteic together. Then we also have to know that cancer may cause cachexia. And then there is this thing called the deficit status, in which the person lacks a certain type of nutrient. For example, deficit of vitamin D causes bone problems, or deficit of vitamin B1, thiamine, causes the beriberi. So now let's take a look how we can get malnutrition in a hospital. So we have an aggression, there is an incident. We develop a neuroendocrine response plus an inflammatory response. Corticoids, adrenaline, GH, immune response, and also the cytokines from the inflammation. I've talked about this in more detail in the physiopathology series of videos. Energetic expenditure increases and therefore the catabolism increases as well. As the catabolism is higher, we have an insulin resistance and a proteolysis. This creates a higher glycemia and higher triglycerides in the bloodstream. Which ones are the risk groups? Well, we have people in the third world that are prone to malnutrition, especially caloric one, but also proteic one. So indeed a mixed malnutrition in the third world. And in developed countries, we find risk groups such as infants, elderly and gestational people, but also the isolated and alcoholic people, and the sick chronic people. These are people with chronic diseases. The population that has also a lower body mass index and uh, lower weight are prone to develop the malnutrition and also the ones with acute pathologies. So in hospitals, what it happens is that we use risky treatments. And for these treatments to actually work, the majority of the times they require a long fasting period and this will create malnutrition indeed. And there is a correlation with higher grade hospitals and the higher patient malnutrition. So the worse is your disease, the higher risk is the treatment and the higher probability of developing a malnutrition in a hospital. Okay, so now let's take a look at the clinical history. So what do we do with the patient in the hospital? There are phases. The first one is the anamnesis. Here, we gather the data of the individual. We take a look at the anthropometric data variation, such as weight. The main one is the weight, the body mass index, also fat distribution, the height, the muscle mass, whatever. Then we also ask for the symptoms, the usual medication of the patient, medication allergies he or she may have, and also the personal and family history. And then, because we are studying nutrition, 
we ask for the dietary history. So the number of meals per day, the hunger and satiety of those meals, in between them, the food preferences they have, food allergies, chewing disorders, if they, they are present or not, if they have dysphagia or not. Dysphagia is something we're going to talk about in more detail in a couple of minutes. If they take any supplements and their appetite to the food. Number two is the physical examination. So here we actually measure the weight using direct or indirect methods and also the variation of it. Here we ask for it and here we measure it. The height, direct, indirect methods. Indirect methods are using formulas. Body mass index, uh, which I have to say that the normal ranges are between 18.5 and 24.9, but for over 65 years old, the normal ranges are between 25 and 29. So a little bit higher to avoid the sarcopenia. Blood pressure of the individual, the heart rate, and also the skin folds, this is to determine the body fat, but it's no longer used. Most people don't usually use this anymore. Then there is the screening, which uh, we ask for the leading symptom, the analytics, a chest x-ray, if there is blood in stool. For females, we ask for a mammography, in males, the prostate, and also an abdominal echo. This is the screening. And then number three, we have the complementary tests. These are free. The first one is the biochemical or analytical assessment in which we take a look at the visceral proteins, albumin, which lasts 20 days in the organism, transferrin, 10 days, prealbumin, two days, and the retinol binding protein, has to do with vitamin A, retinol, which lasts 10 hours in the body. These are called the visceral proteins and they are markers for the quality of the proteins of your blood. Then we also take a look at cholesterol, lymphocytes, vitamins and minerals, and also at somatic proteins such as creatinine which is an indicator of your muscle mass because this is a metabolite that comes from the metabolism of the creatine phosphokinase which uses creatine to create ATP in the muscle for contraction. Then there is also the functional assessment in which we measure the muscle strength using a dynamometry. Then there is also the walking test and this is for example we put uh, two cones six meters apart and uh, we check if they can walk properly and if they go too slow there are more probabilities to actually fall and we say that 1.36 meters per second which is low but this is the required pace to escape death. And then we also tend to do a short battery of physical performance to check indeed the functional of the whole body. And then we have also the body composition techniques. This is using bioimpedance or DEXA scans. And I have a video here talking about this in more detail. So how to implement the clinical history? Well, we use tables for screening and these must be fast, easy, cheap and applicable to the majority of people. There are different tables, but there is no gold standard, so everyone can create one. And indeed, we have the NRS 2002, the MUST and the MNA as the main ones. And here in Canary Islands, we have the CAPA, which indeed is a control of the intake, the protein and the anthropometry. Basically, the intake is here the dietary history, the protein is basically this thing here, and the anthropometry, well, this physical examination. And then we have the GLIM, which is meant to standardize the screenings. They take a look at two things, phenotypic criteria and the etiological criteria. The phenotypic is a low weight, low body mass index, and low muscle mass. And the etiological criteria is a low intake, a low inflammation load, aggression, due to disease. All of this is to check if there is malnutrition or not in the individual. And based on that, having that in mind, we can give some nutritional support. And we have three types here. The first one is uh, by giving a high nutritional value foods. For example, the eggs. The eggs have the best protein profile to correct indeed these visceral proteins. The second one is to use oral supplements, for example, protein enriched food. And the third one, and uh, the one we must be cautious to recommend because they are used only in extreme cases, are the enteral nutrition or even was the parenteral nutrition, which together create the 
mixed artificial nutrition. And I will make a video talking about that. Okay, so now let's take a look at oropharyngeal dysphagia. You have to know that swallowing involves 40 muscle groups and it consists of three phases. The oral one, which uh, has salivation and chewing in the mouth. The pharyngeal, which is the passage of the bolus into the esophagus. And then the esophageal, the bolus goes to the stomach. When treating dysphagia, we must ensure safety and efficacy at all stages of the swallowing. So dysphagia, as a definition, is the difficulty in swallowing. And it is a syndrome, not a disease. A syndrome is a combination of symptoms and signs. The symptoms are the ones that the patient tells you, and the signs are the ones that the doctor sees in the patient. The prevalence of the dysphagia. It is very common in the elderly, in ictus, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis and local cancer. And there is also this thing called prebysphagia, which is in the elderly due to aging, indeed. The symptoms are poor swallowing, nasal regurgitation, cogging during swallowing, weight loss because they cannot really eat, and food in the mouth. There is food left in the mouth after swallowing, and also drooling. These symptoms create a change in the eating habits. This is because you're not really comfortable when you're eating. You associate a meal with suffering because you're not enjoying it, and therefore you are going to eat less and less. That's why we create a weight loss and the malnutrition. Complication. On effectiveness, we can create a malnutrition or dehydration because it's very common to not be able to swallow liquids, so no water. And on safety, we talk about aspiration of the water of all the food. They go, instead of going to the stomach, they get to the lungs and also the respiratory pneumonia because of that and indeed these complications lead to a deterioration of the quality of life the diagnosis as the first step we have to suspect that there is a dysphagia so maybe you have a risk pathology or clinical predictors the second one is using screening we have the it 10 and then also the mecv v this tells us at what and at what volume we suffer dysphagia. So for example, we suffer dysphagia at liquids at a volume of 20 milliliters. Then there is also the GUS, which is meant for vigilance, cogging and swallowing. And then as third type of diagnosis, there is the instrumental using a video endoscopy, a fiberscope, or even better, because it's more precise, the video fluorescence. The downside is that it is radiological. The treatment for the dysphagia are postural measures, so the head forward, no syringes, no straws. The dietary measures are the texture of the diet must be corrected. For example, if you have dysphagia to liquids, then try to avoid liquids. And then their enteral or parenteral nutrition in extreme cases. And of course, to change the texture of the diet, we have the thickeners that can be starch based, no longer used really, and the gum based. These are way better because they are colorless, tasteless, and they resist the amylase. These ones, no. Recommendations for dysphagia is to focus when eating. Also eating with the family, brushing your teeth when finished, and also to avoid double texture foods. An example is noodles, soups, or liquid releasing fruits, an orange, watermelon. Avoid foods with a lot of fiber, and also sticky foods, such as peanut butter, for example. As a conclusion, the oropharyngeal dysphagia is very prevalent and underdiagnosed, as well as being associated with multiple pathologies. That's it, this video is over. I hope you understood the importance of malnutrition in the clinic and also the role of dysphagia in all of this. You can find this diagram by clicking in the description down below. The first link will give you this diagram for free. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one in which we are going to talk about the artificial nutrition, the enteral and parenteral ones. Ciao, hope you enjoyed.